Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar M. Hotep with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And today is Sunday, March the 27th, 2022. And today's discussion argues that African Americans do not have their own culture that we are Americans with Africanisms. I know this is a controversial topic, but you know, I want all the smoke. So you'll get all the smoke and more when we return in just a moment. Thank you, thank you, each and every one of you who are listening live, those of you who are on YouTube, those of you who are on Facebook, and those of you who are watching live from Twitter. Um, I do appreciate each and every one of you. As y'all can see, I'm in a different room today. Um, just getting prepared to move, because at the end of this week, I'll be on my way back to the East Coast. I'll be back in Philadelphia, starting all kinds of trouble in the fashion that I normally do. So uh, before we get started, just want to give a shout out to those who have made themselves known in the chat. And if you are watching live from the Twitter uh, channel, then, you know, they haven't hooked it up yet to where, you know, if you type something in the chat, it'll show up here. So I won't be able to see it. However, those of you who are on YouTube and on the Asar and Hotep Facebook account, uh, your chats will come through uh, and I'll be able to see it. So I am not Pablo is in the building. He says, come on, bro. You're participating in diaspora wars now. You got dang right. It's all the smoke Sunday. And our good brother Zane Montego is in the building. He asked, is America on the dissection board? Not today. We, we kind of know where America is. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir if, if we don't understand who and what America is. But of course, America plays a big role in today's discussion. So uh, peace and blessings to Emmanuel Adama. And OG Gorilla is in the building. Sister Tamika, as always, says this is interesting. And we'll see just how interesting it will be. And follow her lead and make sure that you big up the video by smashing the like button and sharing with your friends and colleagues. Peace and blessings to Sunjiata Atta, Cochran Zombie in the building. And then we have Born Eternal Lord Allah. Peace and blessings. Thank you for joining. We have Bantu Histories in the building. Thank you for joining the conversation. And Credit Point Booster. Uh, peace and blessings. Thanks to you. And Solomon Solomon. Amedics82 is in the house. Selecta Blazing. Thank you. He says, so do you guys not consider hip hop as African American culture. We'll get into that. Uh, Brother Jahuti Ma'at is in the building. He says, this should be entering. He says, so far I disagree. Already, you know how we do. Peace and blessings. Uh, yes, thank you for uh, joining the chat. So, uh, quick announcement, of course. Uh, on Saturday, April the 30th and Sunday, May the 1st, 2022 at the Doubletree Hotel in Detroit, Michigan. 
the One Africa Power in Unity Conference will be going on. Our good people at Hoppy uh, for the for the film Hoppy uh, documentary film, uh, you know, put on a tour and a conference that was uh, due to some controversy has been postponed. And the new date for the conference, as I mentioned before, is Saturday, April the 30th and Sunday, May the 1st. And it is a two day event with a total of 10 speakers. So five each day, I presume. And so uh, we have Brother Jabari Osazi, Dr. Chike Akua, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Dr. Susan Tata, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, Professor James Small, Sister Bayana Bello, uh, Brother Infidishi Jehuti Mess, Dr. Malefe Kitty Asante, Dr. Milana Karanga, and Dr. Theophile Obinga will be in the building. And number 10 on the slot is your brother Asar M. Hotep. And so I'm honored and look forward to uh, having a very important discussion about the interconnections between Africa and essentially how ancient Egypt stole African history. It'll make more sense uh, at, at, at the conference about my uh, about my claim. So make sure y'all uh, go to hoppyfilm.com and purchase your tickets. So I'm not sure how many in in in-house tickets that they have left, but uh, I, I know they're selling fast. Uh, if you cannot make it to Detroit for the event, you can purchase the streaming tickets. So it will be streamed live as well. So um, either way it goes, go to hoppyfilm.com and purchase your tickets. And lastly, at the end, at the beginning of August, I will be releasing my latest text, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, Towards a Meaning for the Place Named Kemet. So y'all know I've been dealing with this uh, issue of the etymology of the place named Kemet and, you know, destroying everybody in their arguments. And this is going to be my, um, at least for now, my final analysis on the word Kemet. It is a full and expanded text. So uh, it, it has a lot of stuff. Some stuff some people have seen because I've I published it in other areas and a lot of it is going to be brand new. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can put this to rest with this text. And so it's a three volume series. The second uh, volume will be an edited text. And then the third volume will just be primary sources and translations, transliterations and translations. So y'all keep your ear to the streets and, you know, continue to support the channel. And remember that we are doing a film called Chiena Into, where we are uh, showing the relationship between ancient Egypt and modern Africa. Uh, especially in Central and West Africa. And so, you know, you can support the film by going to patreon.com forward slash Asarum Hotep and joining our Patreon page. Or you can go to our website uh, dedicated to the film itself. And so that is chinaintofilm.com. And, you know, you can make a donation uh, if you like. And, you know, so please visit the website and uh, share it with others. And right now we are trying to raise 5,000. We're just a little bit over 4,000. And so I'd like to thank all of those who have already donated. And uh, we're putting together a concept trailer that will, uh, excuse me, a proof of concept trailer uh, that will be used for larger fundraising. So to, to do the film adequately and to do it justice, I will be uh, raising uh, $100,000. And so, um, so that's, a, you know, that's, that's a lot of money to ask for. And so I want to show people the quality of the film, you know, what to, to look for and anticipate 
So right now we're just doing the proof of concept trailer uh, as you know a, a vehicle to to do the greater fundraising. So you can uh, support by going to channelintofilm.com and joining uh, or and joining the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Asar M Ho Tep. And so uh, looks like a few others have joined the conversation. So peace and blessings, uh, Kafra Amose. And who else do we have here? It says, I am you, the God. Peace and chat. Peace and blessings. Uh, he says, peace to the chat. But peace and blessings to you uh, for joining the chat. And Amadi Reserve is in the building. Uh, Teti Ursa Ma'at Rasa Neferu is in the building. That good guy has made it to the uh to the conversation so thank you for joining dh in j i don't know if that's new jersey but um peace and blessings to you we have kafra mose he said it'd be nice to have discussions on money investing financial education we need that balance and there are plenty of places you can have that conversation and so we actually do that we have all types of discussions here but before you can get there, you will see why exactly this conversation is important because we like to talk about money investing, but we, we don't want to talk about the basis of, of an economy, and that is culture. And so we'll, we'll get more into that. So Uwa Abantum is in the building. Are we using an Afrocentric or military-based definition of culture? You will see as you continue to listen in this program. So peace and blessings to Donnie Williams, who is in the building. Spin Barrel is made it in the building. Thank you for joining us. And I think that I've covered everybody who has made themselves uh, known in the chat. And so before we get started, I just want to, you know, take a quick survey of the, the audience and so the first question that i'm going to ask is do you believe that african americans have their own culture and you know keep in mind how i worded it that african americans have their own culture so you can uh, put yes or no in the chat. I know it's going to be a delay, so I'm going to give it a minute. And while I am waiting on your uh, your answers, I am just going to remind everyone to... That is right. Make sure that you hit the like button, even if you hate the topic. Hit the like button and share on social media. Make sure that if you are new to this channel, that you subscribe so that you be the first to know when we have an all kinds of these crazy conversations and starting a mess in these internet streets. But looking at the chat, we have a few. Um, so DHNJ says, no. Amadi Reserve says, if African Americans have their own culture, but it is not as near as complex as their ancestors or ancestors for brethren in the homeland of the continent of Africa. All right. He says, select us, says, yes, African Americans have created their own culture. Spin Burrow says yes. Zane Montego says keeping an open mind. Ronwin Fall, I think he's just introducing himself. So peace and blessings. Thank you for joining the chat. Uh, Sunjiata says no. Shahuti Mahat says yes. Born Eternal Allah says no. Teti says yes. Uh, Saja AA says yes. Tamika says I would say a mixture. So a mix of yes and no. Let me see. Uh, org promo, yes. Like I mentioned above, the configuration influences quality does not suggest lack of culture. 
Keep in mind, I didn't say that we didn't have a culture. I said you African-Americans have their own culture. And we'll see what more of that means in just a sec. So yes and no. Same as Khalil. Sadiq says yes. I uh, can't keep it exclusive, but yes. It's an amalgamated yes. I have many part of this on many occasions. That guy's no. Silverback says whether or not other non-Africans appropriate it doesn't matter. Uh, he says, and uh, Kali Hercules says no. And I am uh, you, the God says no, and Big Solo Carolina says no. So we have kind of a diverse uh, set of answers here, and so let's let's uh, let me see. He says, Jay Carter says, of course we have our own culture, and the whole world tries to copy us. FBA, and I guess that's for a foundation of Black Americans. Uh, let me see, forty two tries says nope. Keyword is own. He's, he's already catching on. He's already catching on. So let me let me share my screen real quick. And we're just going to go, you know, just a quick random search. And we're going to do African-American culture um, from Wiki. So let me double check and make sure that y'all can see that. Um, maybe I need to make it a little bit bigger, so I'll do that. And so this is just this is just from the African American. Excuse me, this is just from the Wiki Wikipedia page. So you know, pretty kind of standard stuff. And so it, it goes, you know, it makes the argument that African Americans. It says the distinct identity of African American culture is rooted in the historical experience of African American people, including the Middle Passage. So this argues that we do have a distinct culture. And when it goes to some explaining, I won't be reading uh, much of uh, any of this, but let's look at the elements that it's arguing is saying that, you know, is our culture. And so it, you know, it has a section in here on oral tradition, you know, in terms of um, a few stories, the signifying monkey, African American folk tales, Burr Rabbit, uh, the Uncle Ramus, Stagger Lee, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I guess we got that gift of gab in, in terms of the oral tradition in the word. So that's one aspect of our culture. And then, of course, we have the Harlem Renaissance, um, you know, but that may be kind of controversial. So, those of us who are familiar with African American history, many people kind of you know, are, are critical of the Harlem Renaissance because the motivations for the expressions of art was to show in many respects, uh, white people that we can be just as good as them in, 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 in the arts and things of that nature. And so, uh, you know, so I'm iffy on the Harlem Renaissance, but the Harlem Renaissance was just a period of time that but i wouldn't call that the culture because that was you know just a, a a short spurt of time uh and and that was localized in a in a space that wasn't permeating all throughout the the nation as part of the culture he said it's an african-american culture movement in terms of the black power movement uh give some prominent names here uh, civil rights, then of course music, and you know we got contemporary music. So it, it talks about hip hop and you know hip hop culture, and then of course dance. Um, of course, you know black people know how to dance. So you know of course there's art, but is there a, a particular African American aesthetic in art? Um, that's that's a conversation for another day. But it does recognize, uh, you know, our, our unique visual arts, you know, and ceramics, and then, of course, literature and cinema. And then there's the African American Museum. And then it gives us language, but it's, it's really, is, you know, uh, African, it's, it's labeled African American vernacular English. Um, and then, of course, Ebonics 
for for those you know who um deal with that and then we have fashion aesthetics and attire of course our hair body image you notice that everything here is aesthetic in terms of you know created arts uh language no, excuse me uh dance but even the language even though it it, it has certain west african grammatical and phonetic aspects of it for the most part is still english so we don't have our own language in that sense um and then of course when it comes to religion the religions we practice of course is christianity islam judaism and then buddhism it notes here then there's a few of us with some West African Voodoo and Rastafari, still Christianity, you know, Hoodoo, Ifa, of course, uh, Lukimi, and you know, but thus that those are the minorities in terms of people who have adopted, uh, you know, West African religions and the like, and you know, uh, life events like jumping the broom and you know cuisine you know some of this stuff you can you can argue are aspects of culture but that's what we're going to come to find out is that that's not culture and it, and it says all the holidays and observances for the most part all the holidays and stuff that we observe are european holidays uh, it's very few we have juneteenth uh, but then you know that's still in relation to being free from white people so it's still tied to white folks um, in terms of Juneteenth. And of course, uh, the only, you know, holiday that we have that we created was Kwanzaa by uh, Dr. Milana Karenga and the US organization. But, you know, um, you know, they're, they're Black History Month is not a holiday. <laughs> Black Music Month is not a holiday. Uh, well, I guess it says an observance. And then the names and so African-American names are really just American names, European names, or Latin names, or uh, Arabic names. And, um, you know, it's some things. There's African-American family structure. This will, we will talk on the political and social issues. Uh, I don't know if that, and then African-American LGBT culture, and then population centers, ghettos, you know, I don't know how that's part of the culture, I guess, but and then, you know, if we're in ghettos, it's only because of European folks. And so, so these, these are the elements which Wikipedia, it says, is African-American culture. And so it is... You know, these are some elements, but this is very reductionist uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, you, you see African-American culture and the first thing it shows is fried chicken as part of African-American cuisine, even though chicken comes from Asia, um, just to let y'all know. And... Uh, so uh, let me go back and stop sharing the screen. And so we, we see that a lot of stuff is really kind of aesthetic. Um, and but it doesn't get to the heart and meat of what a culture is. And we'll see why that is. And so what what what. You know, many folks have deemed this culture has been ultimately reduced to song and dance that we can we can sing, we can dance, we can, you know, do some fashion. But it's really not, you know, we just stylize European fashions and, you know, kind of wore them in our own way. And so is that really the clothing of African-Americans? Is that is that something that is birthed? you know, from from our experiences and our values and our sense of style. And so that that can be debated, you know, saying as well. And so uh, what I want to do is, you know, share my screen 
And in some parts, I will do, you know, full screen. <coughs> uh, he says, the culture used to be a real thing here in Los Angeles. It's a cool one display in my mind. He said, fried chicken is African. <laughs> uh, he says, if slavery took your original culture away, and then by default, African Americans have created their own culture to survive the environment separate. Uh, it says separate but equal until the white man, white people integrate. And so, and, and I think what you what you stated here is part of the conversation as a whole. Um, and and why? So my my position is no, we do not have our own culture yet. Um, that we are Americans with Africanisms. Right. As a matter of fact, you can get a book called uh, Africanisms in America um, by Joseph Holloway. It's an edited text. I forgot what year it came out. And but. What we're calling culture in many respects is just the maladaptations to living in an oppressed and apartheid society. And when we get down to what a, a culture is, you'll see more so exactly what I mean. Um, and so, you know, we, we've, we've, you know, been forced into these ghettos. We, we've had to make do with things. And, you know, we're, we're always trying to survive here. And so many of these, these cultural elements that we're saying are really just adaptations to trying to exist in an apartheid society. And, um, and so ultimately these maladjusted behaviors benefit the larger society because, excuse me, the, um, the, the oppressors, because we don't have a system in place. We don't have the culture in place to be able on a, on a wide scale to do for self and identify with self. And so we'll, we'll get into that, uh, now. So, <laughs> As always, I deem these discussions of what I call alluja, and that is to make, provide, or to retrace one's steps, to refer to a, uh, a place of origin, and to restore, to repair that which has been damaged and broken. And so the, the whole idea here is that we're, we're, we're going to trace the steps and to figure out what has been missing, what has been damaged, as a result of the transatlantic slave holocaust and then from there after taking inventory start the process of repairing what had been damaged and so we must recognize first and foremost if we have you know these certain areas i mean certain things and in what areas of our uh, lives in our history have been damaged and need repairing and so uh, that's what this process of Aluja is. And so the first thing that we have to do is just kind of acknowledge where, <laughs> where African Americans, you know, come from. And so, you know, it's over 50 something ethnic groups, but some of the top ethnic groups are the big people, the speakers of Togo, Ghana, and Benin, like the Aja, Mina, Ewe, and Fum. Of course, the Akan and Ashanti of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the Mbundu of Angola, which includes the Ovimbundu, the Bakongo of the Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola. Of course, the Igbo and the uh, the Yoruba of Nigeria, the Mande speakers of Upper Guinea, Wolof in Senegal and the Gambia, the Chamba of Cameroon, and even the Makua or Makwa people as far as Mozambique 
in Madagascar. That's where my maternal uh, lineage derives based upon uh, DNA analysis. And so, so understanding that we come from a diverse uh, cultural and biological background, we, we have, you know, uh, due to horrific circumstances and government policy to strip the enslaved Africans of their language, to prevent them from openly practicing any of their ancestral culture, to demonizing them and replacing in their minds the European culture. So there was a process of enculturation while simultaneously denying us access or being able to integrate into society to take full advantage of the society in which they're forcing us to adopt their culture and, you know, but won't allow us to participate in the larger society. So that's why we had to create and do things, you know, in spite of not being able to integrate into the society at large. And so, you know, there was there were certain things that we have lost as a result of the transatlantic slave holocaust. So I want to read this little excerpt from uh, the late Dr. Asa Hilliard III in an article that he wrote called Race, Identity, Hegemony, and Education. And, and so when in this aspect of the, the, the culture, excuse me, in this aspect of the article, he's talking about uh, the naming practices well, how African people used to name themselves, so how African people named themselves, and then, you know, what happened to us over here in the United States. So we we lost um, part of the the true aspects of the culture, and that is your naming practices. And so when when uh, he he starts off and says these names, he's talking about our original African names were based upon our natal and cultural bonds and thousands of years of heritage. The names were based upon our collective history and creativity. Worse, we had forgotten why we named ourselves and how we named, how we came to be given alien names in the first place. Given the sacred nature of names to African people and given the association of a name, with our identity as a family, this was a tragedy of enormous proportions. Our focus on names became a barren one, I mean, an empty one, a fruitless one. A focus without the benefit of awareness of our rich cultural traditions. Therefore, we were unprepared for the conversation about race, naming, and identity. We had come to a point where we, as a people, were named by others. Most of us had lost control of this. The most fundamental of human processes, the self-determining process of naming ourselves, of telling, not asking the world who we are. And so, you know, the vast majority of African-Americans have names of Europeans, and if they, you know, are of, of, of Muslim, you know, um, religious, they are, they take on uh, Arab names. If they are into Judaism or some form of Hebrew Israelitism, they take on the names of the, uh, the Jews, right, or the Hebrew names. You know, there's many of us who have awakened, who have taken on African names, um, but we are the minority. But the vast majority of people take on either European, Arab, or Hebrew names. And, and this is problematic. So we're coming out of the gate in a colonized state from our parents naming us these these foreign names and so when we named ourselves 
you know, we most of the names, we don't even know what they mean because it's not our native language. If somebody says Michael or Timothy or Robert, do you know what those names means right off the bat? Do you use those words in everyday English? We do not. And so the names don't have meaning. They don't serve as a North Star like they did in Africa. Matter of fact, when you meet an African person, they tell you their name, the first thing you assume is that it has a meaning. And most people ask Africans, what is your, what does your name mean? And so this is, this is evidence of the colonization and the stripping of the culture. So we, we don't have our own naming patterns. We may add a la or a she, you know, here and there, but they're still rooted for the most part in European names, Arab and Hebrew names. So, so he continues in the text. However, there simply was so much more to who we were than our pigment. So how had we come to become preoccupied with what rather than who we were with our political and economic struggle rather than with our essence and our destiny? How had we become individuals rather than family? How did we become a temporal rather than an eternal people, a local rather than a cosmic people? Africans had seen it this way. So in the United States, African-Americans have been reduced to a color. We no longer look at ourselves in relation to cosmos and understanding a common destiny. We've taken on the values of becoming individualistic and becoming temporal with no long range plans for the future of the people in general. And so this, these, these values that have been adopted is, is part and parcel of why the culture has been um, stripped and we just have maladaptations as a result of being on the weaker side of the power relations. So when we came to this country, what did we originally call ourselves? And I've argued that there is there is only one true African people, and that is who we, we call African Americans today. And the reason why is because Africans on the continent only recently in history referred to themselves as Africans, but only in the sense of geo, in a geographical space. But it is the African Americans who, who in the beginning called themselves Africans as an ethnic marker. And we even labeled or named many of our self-help societies um, after our ethnic name. So for example, in the, the 1780s, we had the Free African Union Society. Then we had the Free African Society in 1787 in Boston. And then we have this free dark men of color. I don't know who, who came up with that name, but that was in 1791. Then you have the New York African Society for Mutual Relief, 1808. In the same year, you have the African Grand Lodge um, at, the, at the beginnings of Prince Hall Masonry, right? You have the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Then you have the African Benevolent Society in 1827 in Ohio. Um, then you have the African American Female Literary Association, which I think they just 
reduced now to American Female Literary Association. And then you start seeing words like colored American um, society and things of that nature. But the first, <coughs> the first, <coughs> the first name that we use for ourselves collectively was simply African. And so we are the true Africans. Can't nobody on the continent of Africa say we are not African. We are the first and only ones who have, who have labeled ourselves African. And then we later added the American to denote citizenship. So the Africans in America, right? So, but you can see even the term Africa and African is, is a foreign concept. It was a label placed on the continent itself. And then we adopted the term uh, for ourselves. And so, <clears throat> let me do this. So there, there has to be some, some level of agency here. And as you know, John W. Vandercook has stated, he says, a race is like a man until it uses its own talents, takes pride in its own history and love its own memories. It will never fulfill itself completely. Right. And this is what we're getting at. So when it comes to the the question of culture. There's two fundamental questions that you have to ask. The first one is, what kind of culture must we possess in order to defeat European hegemony and white supremacy? What kind of culture must you have and then you have to ask, do, do we possess that culture, right? And then secondly, what characteristics must a person possess to be the personification of an ideal African-American human being? In other words, what type of person does your culture produce what is the ideal what do you label that see in ancient egypt they had these myths of osiris and aset they are fictional in the sense that these were not human entities but they were ideals of the of the utmost human being in ancient egyptian society they said this is you know this is our culture the culture of ma'at and the culture of ma'at should produce men like osiris and horus and women like aset those are the ideal personifications in our culture. So when we ask these questions for African Americans, what are our ideal human beings? What kind of human being does the culture that we allegedly have produce? So now we're going to get into what is culture? Because we, we, we throw culture around all willy-nilly. And let me see this uh, question. Uh, Travel Life says, do you think pouring out liquor for the dead homies is a distant memory of pouring libation? I believe so. Um, but we do it in ritual, but we don't have a, a deep understanding of what that means. This is the Africanisms that I spoke about earlier. Having the Africanisms is just, is just habit. 
But when you have your culture, you have an understanding of what that means in the culture. Why do we pour alcohol and water for ancestors? What are we doing? What are we saying when we do that? Most people will do it, but they have no idea why. The only thing that you can say is that our African ancestors used to do the same thing, right? And so this is part of the, the issue. <laughs> so what is culture? So the first thing that I want to, to highlight is these seven core areas of culture as uh, articulated by Dr. Milana Karenga, who's also going to be um, presenting at the, uh, the One Africa Conference that we mentioned earlier. So make sure that y'all go to hoppyfilm.com and purchase your ticket. But anyway, so there's, there's, uh, you know, in Africology, in Africana studies, this is, this is the first thing that we, that we learn is these seven core areas. So when you say that, that we have a culture, right, you have to consider these areas. So what is the history? So everybody, every group has a history. You can never you can never not have a history. The only way you not have a history is if you don't exist. But since we exist, everyone has a history. But you know, you have to systematize and, and have people to, to write down and teach that history, right? Then you have mythology. And 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 usually I combine that with cosmology. So I, I put cosmythology. And then you have motifs. Motifs are the the signs and aesthetics that remind the people of the culture how to behave and it uh, it allows through symbolic form to transmit from generation to generation the values of the culture so that's what motifs are and so for each one of these, these, these core areas, you have to ask yourself, as far as African-Americans, what is that for African-Americans? And so we have ethos. Ethos is a value system, excuse me, is the, uh, the, the moral and ethical aspect of the people. And so while, while we have that, you know, it has not been organized in a fashion. And we'll get on to that more uh, in a moment. And so then there's political organization. Then there's social organization. Then there's economic organization. So these three organizations, what it means to organize, are our politics organized? How is the how is our, uh, our our social aspects organized? What's what is the rules? If if I'm a a a person who is interested in in dating someone, right? What are the protocols set in place? For example, that that I would approach a woman or, or and or her family to uh to to ask for her hand in marriage what is marriage to us what does that mean independent of christianity islam and europe right or or more specifically the british the spanish the germans the french you know, Russian, Chinese, of course, the Arabs and the Hebrews, outside of those individuals, for us, what is marriage? What are the rules of engagement in terms of the marriage? What are the expectations? You know, we, we're having uh, gender wars online 
because we don't have our own culture, I argue. And so we don't know what the expectations are for men and women in relationships. <laughs> Zane says he's offering uh, a woman some cows. Uh, he, he taking it back old school, <laughs> right? So these are the seven areas of culture as articulated by Milana Karanga. And uh, Shekhan to joke, you know, has fundamentally reduced it to three primary areas of culture. And he, he labels them as factors. So he talks about the historic factor, that that's the history that was talked about by Milana Karanga. The psychic factor, this in many respects is the, the kind of the social, this would include the, the um, motifs, the, uh, the, the values and ethos in terms of the ethics. All of that is in, the, in part of the psyche, but what also includes fundamentally the inner logic of the culture, the algorithms that are placed in the culture that's placed in the psyche of the people so that they can solve their problems more efficiently and effectively, right? That's the psychic aspect of culture. And then lastly is the linguistic. And so what, what Sheikh Hanti Job has argued is that once you lose the linguistic factor, you cease to be yourself. Meaning like once you stop speaking your language, and this is very problematic for African-American people because you know of the transatlantic slave holocaust and so um so we we keep this in mind and so you know a lot of we're 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 going to be borrowing citations a lot from dr amos wilson and blueprint for black power a moral political and economic imperative for the 21st century which we can um you know, this is this is my my black Bible, you know, in, in many respects. And so, you know, he cites in the text um, Horton and Hunt, uh, who says, you know, provides a workable answer to the question, what is culture? And they state from their life experiences, a group develops a set of rules and procedures for meeting their needs the set of rules and procedures together with a supporting set of ideals and values is called a culture. So it's a set of rules and procedures. Remember I talked about the algorithm. Together with a set of ideas and values. Together is called a culture, according to Horton and Hunt. Right? So we continue. Amos Wilson adds on that socially, culture patterns the ways its members perceive each other, relate to, and interact with each other. This is a very important aspect of the conversation, especially when it comes to African-Americans, because the reason why we are so diversified in terms of our so-called cultures and things is because we do not relate to each other on a fundamental level. We relate primarily because we have a common history in slavery and Jim Crow. And so we're a population that was forced to be grouped together, not because we wanted to, and we organized and designed for ourselves and we're self-determining. We were forced to be amongst and around each other. And that did not give us a basis for relating to each other outside of the color of our skin and dances and cuisines. All of this stuff is forced upon us. So as soon as they get a little freedom, 
you see it, uh, everybody and their mama trying to run from being quote unquote black African American. So we we not African Americans and black. We are the Hebrew Israelites. We are the tribe of Judah, Dan, uh, you know, uh Ephraim and all other kind of craziness. We are the lost tribe of Shabbat. So we 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 lost and found at the same time. Right? I, I don't know how you do that. You you be lost and found at the same exact time. You know, we are the original Arabs, we are the Moors, and we ruled Spain and every we created Buddhism. And we were the first in space as Moors. And, you know, the aliens called us Moors and is documented in this book that they called us Moors in space. The Predator was an original Moor. Um, all this other kind of stuff. And then you just got, I'm not, I'm not black nor white. I am American. You know. I'm I'm just a a, a full blooded American. That is my identity. We run from being ourselves in every every aspect and chance we get, right? But we don't want to claim because we don't have the culture to tie the people together that makes them want to be who they are. We want to be everybody else but. And don't mention an African in connection to the continental Africans. You, you, you start a fight with a lot of folks, say that you, that you came from Africa, that you have anything to do with Africans for, for some folks, you know. And, and this is, this is, you know, problematic on on very uh, uh, on a very large scale. So let's continue. So back in in two thousand nine, I published a text which I'm reworking, and we'll see why in a little bit. Called the Bacala of North America, and one of the things that I that I you know was studying and tackling is this issue of culture and identity, and Throughout my studies, I've come to acknowledge these nine aspects or what I call laws of culture. And if, and, and in my opinion, if you do not have all of these intact, you don't have a culture, not necessarily you don't have a culture, you have, you don't have your own culture. You have a malad, you, you have a, a series of maladapted uh, behaviors, you know, uh, imposed on you by your oppressors and value systems, right? So first and foremost, culture is conscious of itself. It is aware that it is a culture, that it is an entity, that they are a people. And here are the parameters of the people. And we and we looked at those other areas of culture, which that would include. So it's conscious of itself. Culture is a collective agreed upon method of expression. Like we recognize who and what we are when we see it in even in other groups. And to an extent, you know, we kind of have that. We know when other people are trying to misappropriate African-American uh, ideas and value systems and, and the like, right? And so, um, so we continue. Culture is rooted in a philosophy of purpose. So remember the quote from Dr. Asa Hillier that when we were in our right African minds on the continent, our names, the way we did things, there was a purpose to it. There was a philosophy of agency and purpose in the lives. And so your, your culture gives you or, or helps to develop the purpose, helps you to discover your individual purpose in, in regards to being able to use your talents to serve and expand and to solidify and strengthen the community itself, right? 
And I continue, this means all aspects of the culture serve as a survey purpose and is intended to develop a certain type of human being. We discussed this earlier. Culture has a cosmology. So we're, we're the question that you have to ask African-Americans, what is the African-American perspective of the cosmos, how it came into being, and what is our relationship to the cosmos, right? And look at Brother Garfield coming to the conversation all late, asking questions that we already asked. You have to rewind the tape, Brother Garfield. So number five, culture has its own unique language that encapsulates how the population interprets reality. So again, we speak of, uh, English. We 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 just uh, we speak a unique form of English, um, but we speak English. That's not our language. We don't know what all the words mean in the language, and that's why we got to make certain things up and use it in our own unique way, right? But a culture has its own language. Culture has social and physical institutions that maintain and nurture current and future forms of expression. Culture must forever be expanding and contracting. See, culture, culture is a living organism. It's a psyche. And, and it, is, it is adjusting and adapting to the times, right? And so it's, it's, it's forever expanding and contracting. You're also getting rid of certain aspects of the culture that, that no longer serve you, right? And so, but you have to have social institutions and physical institutions to shape and to pass on and to teach the culture. You just aren't born with culture. You are enculturated and you are enculturated in the institutions that you create to pass on the culture. So when I ask African-Americans, what are our cultural institutions where we pass on African-American culture? What education system is ours? What is the curriculum? What do you individually in your language call the people who teach the culture and pass it on along? What is the social divisions of that process? Right? So when we, when we ask these critical questions, then we start understanding how shaky it is to make the argument, you know, in terms of our own unique culture. And so... Number seven, the cultural elements of expression must be ritualized. Ritual keeps the history and the philosophy of the people in the collective memory. Rituals help to strengthen bonds within the community between members and their ancestors. So you, you notice that when, when we have all these other ideologies, right, uh, people start rejecting African-American culture because it goes against the value systems in, um, in these other traditions and values from which they adopted. So I just had a, a program not too long ago about uh, Black Greeks. And, and I was showing how the, the concept of Black Greek, there's only, it's only Greek in name, but even the, the names or the, the letters that are used to represent the Black Greek lettered organizations are only Greek in in that form, but they actually come from Africa. They are, they are, um, they are. What am I trying to say? Uh, they're African in origin. Is, is Metternetcher. So when you see Greek letters, it's just Metternetcher. Just like when you see these Latin letters you see on the screen, this is all Metternetcher. So um, so besides that, you see a lot of, for example, Christians. On, on YouTube denouncing the the uh, the Black Greek letter organizations because they're talking about the aspects of it 
that that you can link to Africa are now demonic and uh, goes against Christian values. How can something that is birthed from your own people and your own mindset, now it is demonic? See, this is what I mean, is when once they once people start adopting other people's cultures and values, they start demonizing and rejecting everything that, that African people create. Right? So, number eight, culture has a constituency who are somewhat conservative in nature, who are the living memory of the culture, who can reorient the culture when it begins to stray from its foundational principles. You know, in, in the classic uh, African cultures, we would call them variations of a word for priest, right? But a, a, a priest is just a, a title for somebody who is responsible for some major aspect of the culture and preserving it and passing it on from generation to generation. African-Americans have no priest. We don't have the people in place that everybody recognizes and, and, and has and can speak authoritatively on these aspects of the culture who pass it down. Why? Because we don't have the institutions. We don't have number six. So if you if you don't have number six, you can't have number eight. You see how these are integrated within each other? And lastly, culture has a formal rite of passage. So the members of the community have clear points in time that marks one's development and maturity within the community. The rites of passage formally introduces the final points of the culture, prepares them to adequately handle and develop power within the culture introduces the members of the corporate community to their purpose and relationship to the opposite sex, the community, the earth, and the duties as parents. And finally, it provides an environment from which the individual can discover knowledge of self, right? So if you have a culture and you have a social and physical institutions, and you have number eight here, for example, um, that culture has a constituency who are the living memory of the culture, the priesthood, then you can create rites of passage programs and curriculum that helps to teach and, and integrate our young people into the culture. See, this is, this is what people are failing to realize when we say we have a culture. No, you. I mean, we have our own culture. No, you have a culture, a maladapted culture. It is primarily a European culture with Africanism sprinkled in there. But you don't have your own because you don't have a way to pass on the culture. You don't have a, a recognized rites of passage from New York City to, to Atlanta to New Orleans to, to California. To, to, to the um, to Compton, you know, Watts, uh, even the Bay. There's no common rite of passage that that uh, is expected. It doesn't matter where I go amongst the Yoruba, in Yoruba land, in terms of Ifa, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Even though they may do it differently in certain parts of Nigeria, when you're getting put into Ifa, there is a common and expected rites of passage. And there's millions, like 100 million of, of Yoruba folks, right? So this is these are the things that we have to keep in mind. So that's my nine laws of culture. And so I tentatively define culture as uh, I say that culture is the institutionalized organization of the physical and social forces of life so that they, one, can aid the human person in developing one's own powers of being, two, can provide tools that enable one to tower over life's challenges, three, encourages one to celebrate life's beauties, four, fertilizes one's own seeds of greatness, and five, 
encourages the person to discover new, more satisfying dimensions of being human in community and the world at large. These five things is a lecture unto itself, but this is just here for your records and it's in the book that I published in 2009, which I'm redoing because um, uh, I've, I've updated a lot uh, since then. So, you know, we're going to get on a few of the final points. So if you have a culture, your culture is supposed to develop a certain type of human being. And so I'm going to ask a question again to the audience. If African-Americans have a culture, have their own unique culture, what is the certain type of human being that the culture is supposed to create? I will give you a minute because I know that uh, there's going to be a time delay, you know, in from when I say this. And while I do that, I will quickly do this. So remember, the question is, what type of human being does African-American culture develop? What is the ideal human being? Uh, put it in the comments and I'll read some when we return in just a sec. <laughs> You see, I have a lot of things, a lot of things that's on my mind, and I would like to let them out. Look, I see reality breaking down all my fantasies. It would be nice if I at least had one fantasy. That neutrality about to take a terabyte from the American apple pie better get a slice. It's kind of scary the way that this life is moving on. Marvin's doing backflips inside his grave. What's going on? We have head on collisions, not seeing another's vision. Maybe that's the reason why some colors fit the description. A lot of relationships need life rafts, sinking ships. I guess you just can't have only one like potato chips. I would love for you to listen with an open heart, but would you really even hear me if it's torn apart? I don't do the things that I used to. I'll be fine even if I lose you. Okay. see what a few of y'all have said so she said metro says truthfulness uh selected says nwa is on there that's probably so he says a good human being sister tamika he says africans in america are colonized so just of elite european men um uh, zane says i don't know how and it says Michael A. Pathological. <laughs> uh, he says Sunjiata says I'm drawing a blank. Damn, that's depressing. He um, says sovereign, self-determining Africa's human being. So, so your so remember what I asked. Not not what we would think, but what if the question is if African Americans have their own culture, what is the the certain type of human being uh, that the that African American culture creates. So you're arguing that African American culture creates sovereign, self determining Africans, human beings. So uh, I'll, I'll let you you know come back with that. He says, if you don't know, swagger is a real thing. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. He said, uh, nope. Yeah, I have enough. Good human being, a loving person, a real individual, successful person, one who people can depend on, knows the values of life and people. Okay. And, and so the African world says, nope, I'm an African through and through. All right. And so we, we see it's a little bit um <laughs> it says African world. So you think African culture here in America is kept within African vision? Okay, y'all having a different discussion. He says, one with the worldview. Uh, he says, I'm saying that's what the culture should strive for. All right. But but that's not currently what it what it produces right now. So I agree with you. And 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 I do this exercise just to, to help prove the point. Because once you once you understand that culture develops a certain type of human being, and then when you ask African-Americans, well, what type of human being does African-American culture produce? Then we draw blanks. 
All right. So we'll continue. So this this idea that is supposed to create a certain type of human being was echoed by um, Dr. Amos Wilson in Blueprint for Black Power. So he says that culture constructs definitions, meanings and purposes. These cultural constructs are used to proactively and reactively mold the mind, body, spirit, and behavior of the constituent members of a culture, right? So the culture provides definitions, meanings, and purposes, meaning goals, right? And so it does this by molding the mind, body, spirit, and the behavior of the constituent members of the society so that it can reach those goals. It can fulfill those purposes set out by the culture. So when you, if you understand the underlying uh, connections of, of these aspects of this statement, then you can sum it up is that culture develops a certain type of human being that will serve the community to help strengthen it, to, to uh, be able to defend it against internal and external threats, to be able to um, expand the culture and the community at large. So that's why I said it has to be conscious of itself because it, it understands its purpose and what are the long-term goals and strategy of the community and of the culture. This is why these nine laws exist uh, that I created. And so, so we just kind of hinted on it, but culture is done on purpose. So he can see, I mean, he can, uh, he continues. He says, at times, cultures, societies, and various types of social organizations may be conceived of as conspiracies, right? So what is a conspiracy? What does it mean to conspire? Let's read this again. At times, cultures, societies, and various types of social organizations may be conceived of as conspiracies, meaning that cultures are created with an intent in mind. And so when I ask people, when have African Americans ever in, in the 400 years that we've been on this, um, uh, this continent in North America, in the United States, has African Americans sat down and, and organized and developed its culture? We have just been going and feeling and, and doing things very unorganized and responding to oppression and things of that nature. But, but never have we just sat down and said, this is how we're going to do this. This is what this means. This is what we're going to do because that's what a conspiracy is. We conspire together. Culture is a conspiracy. It is a conspiracy to develop a certain type of human being, a man and woman that will serve the community and to strengthen it. So we, uh, Kali says that we use culture loosely. That was my point at the beginning. Just because you have expressions doesn't mean you necessarily have your own culture because your culture is intentional. It is a conspiracy. So what does, what does African-American culture conspire to do if we have it? Right? So we're just a population 
trying to find itself at times. <laughs> he says, no, sorry, we've had organizations that advocated changes in the values of colonized Africans in America. I agree, but we have not adopted. Again, we're Christians, Muslims, we're Buddhists, we're Hebrew Israelites, we're space Moors, we're the Asiatic black man, we're foundational black American Indians, we're everybody but ourselves. So again, culture is done on purpose. People sit down and organize and develop the culture. It doesn't fall out of the sky, right? Culture you can't find underground dug up somewhere. Human beings create culture. And they're wise people. Their creatives sit down and organize. They have a vision. You know, what was that movie? You got to have vision. Somebody tell me if, if y'all old enough to remember that, that movie. You got to have vision. That's what black people need. Vision. In America. Right? So... He continues, I'll make this full screen. <laughs> As a political economy, identity is an organization of interest, taste, desires, passions, ideals, motives, values, knowledges, abilities, skills, etc. The key word here is organization. Sure, we have passion. Sure, we have motives. Sure, we have abilities and skills and passions, and we have values. But a political economy, which is part of the culture, is the organization of these things, right? The pursuit of the satisfaction, exercises, and realization of which helps to maintain the social power relations, social prerogatives, and the integrity of social, political, economic systems which characterize a particular culture and its status quo. Thus, in both the commercial and non-commercial sense, an ethno-cultural group trades on its culture on its identity. This is what people uh, fail to realize in many parts of this discussion. The reason why, well, part of the reason why you develop uh, a culture is uh, because you're trying to develop a certain type of human being. But within that larger framework, within that larger discussion is the notion of economy and trade and people trade on the culture. You have to, you, 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 certain aspects of your culture are for sale. And if you are trying to be like everyone else and not distinguish yourself from everyone else, you cannot have a viable economy because you're never going to outdo the originals. You're, you're never going to outdo a British or uh, uh, on being British. You're never going to outdo the Arabs on being Arab. You're never going to outdo the Hebrews for being Hebrews and Christians for being Christian. That's not your culture. You're never going to outdo and outshine the Chinese and, and Indians on being Buddhists and Hindus because that's not your culture. Right? Doesn't matter how we, how many of us are integrated into those things. You create for yourself and you trade in the world on your culture and identity. So we speak of German cars, you know, French fries, even though it didn't start in France, 
right? We talk about Chinese food. We talk about, uh, you know, Indian food and 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 Brazilian jujitsu. Right. The culture is embedded in the product itself. And so we start developing our own and putting our stamp, our cultural stamp on it and walking in the world bravely in terms of our food, in terms of our clothing and design, in terms of our architecture, in terms of our art, right? These are, these are the things that you trade on and you control the, the means of production of those things so that your community eats. And so we'll come up with concepts and then we'll have everybody else produce the basis of it and then give us crumbs. You know, the music industry is a good example of this. And we can no longer operate in that fashion, right? Gotta own land, gotta own the raw materials. Produce your own vegetables and food and trade it with your own restaurants. Produce your own cotton and, and fabrics so that you can sail amongst each other and create your own fashions. Get land, grow your own wine vineyards and the like. This is what must be done. You trade on your identity. You trade on your culture. That's the basis of economy of economics, right? So within that um, that larger con, uh, context of culture being done on purpose, Dr. Kaikosa Kajangu in his PhD dissertation, Beyond the Colonial Gaze, Reconstructing African Wisdom Traditions, states that the ancestral vision, remember you got to have vision, is a vivid expression that describes why a particular community of memory exists and what types of human beings it intends to deliver. It expresses the feelings that members of that community of memory hold for their community and its place in the world. Often this vision is the name that the community gives itself. Culture is done on purpose. There's a vision for the community. And in order to realize that ancestral vision, those nine laws of culture are enacted and they're all combined and used to develop a certain type of human being. So when you say that your people have a culture, what type of human being is intended for the culture to deliver, right? So group identity, remember that culture is conscious of itself. The group identifies as such. We have too many people wanting to be everything else but themselves. And, and this is why it is important. So Amos Wilson, again, socially, culture patterns the way its members perceive each other, relate to and interact with each other. Right? How do we relate to one another? Are, are we only relating because we have the same skin color and... We, we are both descendants of enslaved Africans. Is that, is that the basis of our relation? Are we only relating because we have a common enemy? Is that the basis of our relation? And can you continue to be as a people if those are your only two 
basis for relating. This is the this is the question. We continue. Group identity exists when each member of a group or a significant majority of them perceives his or her membership in the group and his or her sharing of its defining characteristics, its defining values, attitudes, and behavioral tendencies as the most important or the primary defining characteristics of himself and herself as an individual. It's about how we relate to one another. If we don't have a deeper way of relating to one another, how do we expect to have successful intimate relationships in our society? How are African-American and in general, African men and women supposed to relate to one another. What is that conceptual and philosophical grounding? Not simply because you are the descendants of enslaved Africans and that y'all have similar shades of color and y'all in similar hair textures and lip size. That's not enough. That's not a good basis to build a culture and a people on. That's not how we did things back in the day. You had a rich worldview and your cosmology informed you of who you are and how you relate to the world and the environment which shape how you relate to each other, right? Group identity is evident when each member of a group organizes. You, you, you know, uh, Amos Wilson loves that word organize. There's, there's something about that word organize and organization. Group identity is evident when each member of a group organizes and directs his or her behavior in ways intended to maximally or primarily benefit his or her group. Group consciousness, one or more of the other members as well as him or herself. So I'm looking out not only for me and my family, I also have my people in mind. And so you know you have a group identity when you're thinking in group terms. How is what I am doing beneficial to me personally? my family secondly, my community thirdly, and I will add African people as a whole fourthly, right? What was that thirdly? Either way. This is, these are the kinds of things that we need to, to understand. And so Milana Karanga adds, for identity is the key to purpose and ultimate direction. In other words, a people's self-definition, that means how they define themselves, is a framework for establishing a people's purpose and the direction by which it must pursue that purpose, given its social historical circumstances. You got to have vision. I'm gonna find that 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 uh there's an image. Uh let's see if I can find that. Uh I think I found it. I'm I'm gonna add this to my my stash here. I want, I want to be able to pull this up every single time I say it. Uh, let me go. Sorry, I had to pause the, the, the lecture real quick just so I can find this image. So some of y'all know the, the movie I'm talking about. 
So I forgot the film, but it see this is this comes from the movie that Black Dynamite was based out of, right? You got to have vision. I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna take this. Uh, I'm gonna take this image. I'm gonna put that on. So throughout this conversation, know when I say you got to have vision, it this is this is what you should be picturing every single time. Uh, I say this, right? You got to have vision. That's what it's saying here. For identity is the key to purpose and ultimate direction. In other words, the ancestral mission, the ancestral vision, right? So culture, someone asked a question about economics and things, right? And in chapter three of Blueprint for Black Power, it is titled Culture as the Basis of Power. And culture, there is no economy without culture, right? This is what we got to understand. People are trying to... to uh, move too fast without understanding these fundamentals uh, that we have here. So, Amos Wilson says, this coalescence of subcultural social units is usually organized and motivated by a mutually recognizable leadership or governing establishment. This establishment usually fulfills its responses. Remember what I told you? that there's a constituency, a, a priesthood, for a lack of a better term, in the culture. That's, that's what we lack. There's a mutually recognized leadership or governing establishment, a priesthood in the culture. This establishment usually fulfills its responsibilities through the creation, issuance, and enforcement of policies. At this level of organization, a culture may be defined as a political organization. Remember uh, Karanga's seven areas of culture, and one of them was political organization. Culture may be defined as a political organization, which exercises political power in its defense, economic and social interests as a whole, and in the interests of subcultural group and individual members, right? And so a source of power, in fact, the ultimate base of power is the power of ideas, the power of mind, of thought, imagination, and what? Vision. I needed to have that word highlighted. If I do this again, I'm going to have it highlighted. So again, a source of power, in fact, the ultimate base of power is the power of ideas, the power of mind, of thought, imagination, and vision. The power of symbols, motifs, one of the seven areas of culture, and the word. The power of ideation and translation of ideation into action are manifested in a multitude of personal, social, cultural, and physical forms. So you have to have the framework. You have to have the ideas. You have to have the cultural inner logic so that you can think of creative ways to solve problems, which become the basis of your economy. Because each one of you in the group were born with a certain set of talents and interests, and you develop them to serve the community. And since everybody in the community can't be everything and all things at once and, and, and for everybody, we pay each other to solve each other's problems. Continue. So to, to answer the brother's question on the cultural piece, let's 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 go here on the falsification of African consciousness 
This is also Dr. Uh, Amos Wilson. We're suffering from the absence of an economic system. Money is not a system. Money is what it is. A system involves the systematic and organized utilization of money. A systematized utilization and distribution of money. Without the pattern, without the system, without the organization, one does not have an economy. An economy exists prior to money because the culture has to exist prior to money. You can't have a, um, a, an economics discussion without a cultural discussion. There were economies in the world before money was invented. We don't even have to have money to have an economized system. So ultimately, when we study an economic system, we recognize that an economic system at its base refers to the nature of what relationship of the relationship between people. How do you relate to one another? That's what the culture gives you. It's the systematic way people choose to relate one to the other that makes an economic system, not money. You can't talk money until you talk relationships. When we lack a systematic way of relating to each other, then we can have money and still be poor, have money and be robbed, which is what we are speaking to African-Americans specifically. So in that same text, uh, let me go back. He asked the question, why do we suffer from this problem then? Why is the black personality created? I try to get across this fact that every maladjusted characteristic in the black personality serves an economic function. So when this this is what I was hitting at earlier in terms of people not really understanding that a lot of what we're calling African American culture just maladjusted characteristics that were that were forced upon us and it serves an economic purpose for the people who maintain the society and so each maladjusted characteristic is not there by accident. It's not there simply because Europeans hate us. It's there because it maintains their economic dominance. I can't have you over here talking about um, being sovereign and having agency and, and supporting Black business. Because when you do that, you no longer are dependent on me. I have to disturb that. So I have to shape your values. I have to change your perception of yourself. Black people stuff ain't good as, as European stuff. Come over here to France. Come over here to Germany. Don't go to HBCU. Go to Harvard. Go to Yale. Our ice water is colder than your ice water. And this is what we become. You're, you're Moors. You're not African people. You're not African Americans. You're space Moors. You are the Asiatic black man. You are the lost tribe of Shabazz. You are the lost tribes of Israel, all 12. You're in this condition because you disobeyed God. You got that nappy hair because you disobeyed God. You see the straightness on your eyebrows? Your eyebrows are straight, but your, your, the head on your head isn't straight. The hair on your head isn't straight. That's because... You know, the, the ugly that that was on the inside got turned on the outside. And 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 so now you're ugly on the outside too. And you got blacker and your lips got bigger and your nose got wider because 
you disobeyed God. Don't wear your natural hair because then you have to go and 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 open up your own shops and do your own hair and create your own products for your hair. You know what's best for your hair. But don't do that. Get get our wigs, get get our perms and look like us. Straighten your hair. Get that blonde. If you was a black man in the 80s, get that nouveau curl. Get that. See, you see Ice Cube? Ice Cube got the curl. You can get the curl too. Come on in. Right? Don't don't trust. Don't trust each other. The black man ain't a th black woman. Date white men. White men are are good for you. Sure, they raped you and killed you in the past, but that was the past. Let bygones be bygones. That black man ain't good for you because when you start having children with him, y'all keep increasing all that melanin, and we gotta diversify the colors spectrum here in in the, in the states. So you know. Um, this is what they do. So if I've got money, I can help you. But if I distrust you, I won't help you. And you may not make it. It's not the absence of money. It's the presence of mistrust. If I will not cooperate, if you cannot rely on me, then we cannot have an economic system even though we may have money. In other words, a people must trust, be reliable, be dependable, have respect for each other if they are to develop a viable economic system. When they have those kinds of relationships, they have a social system and they can build and they can grow economically. There's a reason why Europeans put all these restrictions and in things in place and make you get licenses to do certain jobs because there were so many uh, frauds and people scamming in, in the early society. There's still a lot of them now, but you know, this is why they had to have these, these regulations in the society because they understood that when people don't trust businesses, economies can't grow. And so we have to have a standard from which to operate so that people will trust the system and participate in it. Right? So this is this is what we're doing here. And and I thank you sister um, I see on my phone that you you gave a donation sister Tamika and so I just wanted to acknowledge that and uh say bless you. And, and thank you uh, for that, right? So we talk about economics. Everybody want to jump to economics. They want to put the, uh, the economic cart in front of the cultural horse. And we can't do that. It's the culture that leads the, the economics because it's the culture that informs you on how to relate, why we relate, and what are the expectations and behavior of the people who belong to this culture? What, what problems have we solved? What techniques have we developed? What new ways, what new problems must we solve? And what is the long-term vision? for the society. And this is what Shekhan Diop, you know, was arguing essentially in his text, Black Africa, the economic and what cultural basis for a federated state. And in this text here, Wretched Kush, he says something that is, um, you know, uh, understood and profound. He's, he says, Doyle provides an even more explicit consideration 
of the dynamics behind native agency. He argues that while the interests of the agents of contact, in other words, resources exploded, exploited, must be considered. The character of the dominated society plays a critical role in imperial outcomes. He divides conquered societies into three levels of internal complexity, tribal, patrimonial, and feudal, uh, tribal, patrimonial, and feudal. According to Doyle, a tribal society's critical lack of centralization and social differentiation makes it particularly vulnerable to aggression. And so the development of culture the organization of its physical and mental resources allows for the culture and the people to defend itself against external threats. But as long as you are divided and you don't have a common unity that goes beyond the surface level skin color and nose size, and you know being descendants of enslaved africans when you have something deeper and richer for which the people relate and you have a system of of problem solving techniques and the like and you have an economy you can defend yourself against aggression and right now we are powerless in many respects because we are so divided and we want to be everything else in the world except ourselves. And so this is why, for me at least, I comb all of African-American history, all of African history, and I find the, the jewels, the tools, and the best of what it means to be human. And I try to take that and formulate that into a way that we can develop a new African American uh, culture, right? One that will will help us to defend against our aggressors. And so, why should we create a culture from scratch? So, Milana Karang informs us in two thousand eight in his text on Kwanzaa. The first act of a self-conscious, self-determining people is to redefine and reshape their world in their own image and interest. So we're going to have to we're going to have to start from scratch. We're going to have to to take inventory of who we are and and build on that. See, everybody thinking that you have to have something ancient in order for it to be viable and good. Culture is not sacred in the sense that, um, that it can't be changed. Remember that culture is dynamic, it is fluid, and it, and it is designed to solve a community's uh, set of problems. The moment that your culture no longer serves in that capacity is the moment that you have to adjust, adapt, and, and reconsider aspects of your culture, develop new tools and techniques so that the people survive perpetually into the future, right? So, you know, one of the, the seven principles of Kwanzaa is Kuja Chakalia, which means self-determination, to define ourselves, name ourselves, create, ourselves and speak for ourselves. And this is the stage where we are at in African American history. This generation from us going down, we're going to be the architects of a new African American culture and one that serves us and helps us to survive and thrive into the future. And we're going to have all of these things that were, were talked about in this discussion and more in consideration. And so uh, Conflict of Minds, Doc, I mean, uh, Jordan K. Ingomani out of South Africa, uh, uh, Zulu, right? In 1979, he published his text. And on page 60, he says, to be human is to be able to say what 
and who you are and to be able to say why you are here and where you are going. When you say where you're going, what is that equal to? Vision. You got to have vision, direction, purpose. It is to be able to define yourself. So no longer are African Americans going to be taking these, these definitions that others give us. We are a unique people here. And, you know, our history has brought us together. And now it's time to, to, to take it up a notch and become uh, a people and not simply a population. He continues, ancient Zulu philosophers taught that the person was unique and that he defined himself and that he knew the worth of the value that he was. And so uh, Kaikosa Kajangu in his, uh, in his text, Wisdom Poetry, he states the second fundamental principle about traveling on the superhighway of wisdom that is a an open uh, trail of for wisdom seekers to get initiated into different African uh, wisdom traditions or societies, right? So the, the African superhighway of wisdom is speaking in one's own name. Every sage that I have so far encountered on my journey to wisdom has told me as he, she was told by their mentors, speak in your own name, never in mine. What does this mean? Sages will tell you to nourish your mind with teachings that have been enriched by countless generations of sages, but they insist that you must remain truthful to the voice that brought you into life or the voice of your destiny. This is a very important quote for the simple fact that. As this uh, professor, who I, I believe he's a, a, a native of Zimbabwe or Malawi, I think it's Malawi, and but he's traveled. He actually he actually was initiated and in studied under Kredu Mutwa for a while, and everywhere that he went, where he was getting initiated, he would they would tell him to speak in his own name, never in theirs. And that you must remain truthful to the voice that brought you into life. So this is on an individual level, but this can be scaled up to the, the community and cultural level. And so African-Americans, we, we, we are the conglomeration genetically of over 50 something ethnic groups uh, and, and, and biological groups that that came from Africa as a result of the transatlantic slave holocaust. Many things were stripped, some things were retained, new things have been developed. And in this process of re-Africanization, some of us have adopted, you know, whole identities to where we're Yoruba folks, we're Akan folks, we're ancient Egyptians, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm arguing is that we keep this in mind that was, was written in the text by Dr. Kajangu. And that is that we speak in our own name and never in theirs. We take the best of what they, they have to offer the world. And we integrate the fundamentals, the spirit and the characteristics of what that is. And then we mesh it, we adopt it, we integrate it to our own thing and in the process, we're developing our own way of doing and ways of being. And this is what is required in this day and age. And so some would say, you know, why can't we just, just be African and all of this other kind of stuff, right? And so This chapter that was written in a text that was edited by the late uh, Dr. James Conyers um, on, on Afrocentricity, it's called Afrocentricity in the Academy. Uh, she wrote a, uh, an article called Pan-Africanism, Feminism, and Culture. And this is uh, Mars Conde. So let me bring this up. So she says here in the following, many people might say that we in Guadalupe and the Caribbean at large are very far from the principles of Pan-Africanism. 
but I don't believe we are. There is a West Indian proverb. It is only when you have swept your house that you can go out. I believe we are in the process of sweeping our houses and achieving our independence. I personally still believe on Pan-Africanism, but the idea was born in the minds of diaspora people at a time of great racial and physical oppression. While still extant, meaning that it still survives or still present, is it is excuse me is not as severe today as it was then. For this reason, I believe we should shift our interest to culture. We should busy ourselves by protecting our culture, making an inventory of it, and trying to see exactly what we are and what we possess. I think when we finish that inventory, we will better understand Pan-Africanism. Du Bois, Garvey, and Crewman, and the rest had beautiful and grandiose ideas, but they were ahead of their time. I believe it, were, it will be the role of future writers, male and female, to turn the minds of the people towards the world and to make them understand that there is a need for unity, diversity, and Pan-Africanism. If we were not allowed to be diverse and different, we cannot be united. And I, and I believe uh, everything that she says here. So what does it mean when we talk about Pan-Africanism? And so Pan-Africanism can be safely equated as an ideology that takes the Black race, the Africans everywhere, as one political and cultural unit, having a common history in the past and a common destiny in the future. Pan-Africanism is a Wilton Schonstrung, I don't know what that, it's German, I don't know what that means, born out of resistance to subjugation, slavery, racial domination, and that takes unity of the Black race and empowerment of the same as a way to reverse the negative trajectory. Thus, what captures the heuristic essence of Pan-Africanism is the fact that it is a struggle for self-determination of Africa. It is a struggle for Africa to be the master of its own fate and a quest for dignity as a member of mankind endowed with all attributes of a society for self. So the idea of Pan-Africanism is to create a global social and political cultural unit. That's why um, Shekhan Diop in one of his interviews made this statement. We must reconstruct a new Afro-American cultural personality within the framework of our respective nations. Our history from the beginning of mankind rediscovered and relived as such will be the foundation of this new personality. So not only um, is are we talking an Afro-American cultural personality, but he's talking about a, a new African a, a, a pan-African uh, cultural and social personality that exists on the continent itself. Because then that's why he wrote the book. This was in the book um, as well, uh, Black Africa, an economic and cultural basis for a federated state. He has always been about having a federated state. So, you know, when we juxtapose this with the conversation of of Conde mentioned earlier, we have these individual units that are working together and trading with one another to build a larger economy. But African Americans cannot, you know, participate in this if we don't have our own. And so I want to go and buy Yoruba art. I want to buy uh, and, and eat Wolof food in the same way that they would come and purchase African art be part of our initiations, and we do the same when we go there. It's, it's because we have a deeper way of relating to one another, now we can build uh, an economy and, 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 and have one that is independent of what, what exists here solely in the United States, right? And so this is a, this is a graphic that I created a long time ago when I, when I wrote the book, The Bacala of North America, because that's the name that I suggested that we adopt as African-Americans. I have since changed that to the Incole. Uh, by Incole would just be the human plural prefix. Uh, will, buy, uh, will be the prefix. But uh, 
so just you know understand this in in the context that was just spoken of so i talk about the consanguinity of african-american identity so we have africans as a whole i've since suggested a new name for africa called bukanda um and uh because that the word kanda is one of the most dominant uh words for land community and and family in africa that you find all across africa and so that's one of the reasons why the name was suggested and so so you have that as a whole and collective then you have you know it's divided up into three main sections you have the northeast malela or, or uh uh you know uh bakanda uh people right and so you have the Oromo, the Collagen, the Tigrinya, Nuba, Gael, Somali, Tereg, Amaringa, Tutsi, Maasai, Avriga, Berber, Beha, etc. Right? Then you have in West Central Africa, the, the Wolof, the Mandingo, Malinke, Balente, the Bakongo, Bambo, Luba, Kabinda, Mbangala, etc., and Bundu. Then you have the diaspora. Bukanda, I mean, uh, Bakanda, you know, the people of, uh, of, of Bukanda, right? And so you have the, you know, the Bayan Kole, which is us, the African Americans. And then you have the Afro Caribbeans, the Afro Mexicans, the Afro Brazilians, the Afro British, right? And so we're individual groups that make up this pan African political unit, you know, um, anchored and centered in this space called Bukanda because this this term Africa has been imposed on us with no meaning and and, and is not rooted and grounded in the, in in the, the culture around the continent itself right so you know what are the elements of African American culture that we can organize so remember I'm not arguing that there are no aspects or or elements that you would consider African-American culture. What I'm saying is that it's not organized and it's not purposefully done so with the intent of creating a particular type of human being, which is something that we have to organize in the near future. And so people will ask, well, why do we need to do this? We are already Moors and Native American Indians. We're Omex, we're the Mayans, we're the, the space Moors and we are the uh, lost tribe of Shabazz and the, the uh, Asiatic black man. And we are the original Chinese and uh, we are the Hebrews. We are the 12 tribes. And we got a chart that you can look at and see where you are. If you're from Jamaica or you're from Haiti, you're from the tribe of Benjamin, et cetera, et cetera. There's, you South America, you're Issachar, Mexican, da 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 da, you know, all this other kind of craziness, anything but ourselves. And so, you know, a few African proverbs saying, having a family field doesn't prevent you from digging your own. So, just because they we may have been a certain people in the past does not mean that we cannot develop our own. Say, so a bird does not think that his own nest is shabby. If nobody praises one, one must praise oneself. How do we praise ourselves? What is our praise name? What is our collective vision? Had to throw that in there just one more time. Right? Let's continue. So a lot of this legwork has already been done. By, by many of our scholars, and especially uh, this one here. He was originally supposed to be in the One Africa Conference, but I, I believe due to some scheduling conflict or something that he was not able to uh, participate. So, um, and for those who don't know, this is Dr. Wade Nobles, one of our prominent uh, psychologists in the community. And he, he has written in several of his texts uh, the African American cultural precepts and uh, reoccurring themes. So, you know, we won't have time to go into detail of what all of this means, 
but just understand that there, there has been an inventory done on the characteristics of African-American people. And, and so it is at this point is, is we have to put this in more literature and spread this out and, and have this part of the curriculum so that people understand who they are and what are the characteristics that make them unique. And so what he, what he, he, the first cultural, the eight cultural precepts are consubstantiation. This, uh, that, you know, essentially we are one and the same, uh, interdependence, egalitarianism, you know, because that's the first thing that we always been fighting for is equality in this, uh, country. Cause we understand that, you know, when there is, uh, extreme inequality, there's extreme violence and exploitation, collectivism, transformation. You know, we're always transforming. We're always adapting, coming up with new things, you know, uh, cooperation, humanness, being human is, is at the center of, of African-American being. We're always trying to be that. We always celebrate when 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 someone expresses their humanness and humaneness is an expectation and then synergism our ability to to synthesize and amalgamate various different things into the culture right and so um there are an additional nine african-american reoccurring themes that that has to be highlighted and organized and and explored and exploited in in very systemized way and that is spirituality resilience humanism communalism orality and verbal expressiveness right we got that just we got that gift to gab you know um personal style and uniqueness realness emotional vitality musicality and rhythm so it's not that we don't have the elements, it's the issue of systematizing them, organizing them in a way that it becomes viable and that we can build and eat off of these things. Right? So, you know, y'all know that I have, you know, part of this African American culture development project, I have initiated a few things that I hope catches on, but I've, you know, first thing that I started off with is the name. What is what is the purpose? What is our name? And then uh, in traditional African fashion, we have a totem. So I argue that our totem is the sun. And then it also includes this Bakongo spiral. This is actually kind of a pan-African spiral and it has a meaning. I have a whole lecture on what this means, but th I'm, I'm suggesting that this is our totem the sun, right? And ba in kole, the root is in kole, which means a powerful, an eminent and a powerful person. When we put ba in front of it, we're going to use bantu uh, grammatical structure. So ba is the human plural, the ba in kole or ba in kola, the eminent and powerful people, the people who put in the work, right? And, and this is a goal, this is a vision for the people. Anything that we do ultimately has to be about the proper obtaining and handling of power. And power is the ability to do work, to make things happen. And so we are the people who make things happen. And note, and I note that this word in kole is cognate with the word nature in ancient Egyptian, and even the word Heru. But we're borrowing from Bantu, and we're going to adopt uh, a Bantu language. So when I talk about the culture, the algorithm, you know, uh, just a word for culture, I suggest we adopt the Zaluja. And I suggest that we also adopt Kiswahili as our official language, right? And the reason why we, we adopt 
Kiswahili as our official language, because remember, our language is English, but that's not an African language. And, you know, we're we're not in a business. We don't have enough time to try to invent a new language. So instead of taking a language that already belongs to a specific group and then we'll be charged with misappropriating their language and culture, we adopt a language that is already widespread and that isn't really narrowed down to a specific people. And that is Kiswahili, which is a trade language in Central and East Africa. So my suggestion is that Kiswahili be the official African-American language. And this will require a, a critical mass of us to learn the language and to teach the language. And eventually we're going to have to start writing in the language. And so uh, I talk about a, an African-American religion. I have named it either Bolingo or Malinga. It's just a word for love in, in, in Central Bantu. And it's cognate with the word ma'at. So ultimately, ma'at and the principle of love, open-hearted sharing, you know, have a whole discussion on this. That is the religion. And we can get into that at, a, at another time. And the ethical system, the, the label for the ethical system, I, I suggest in some Betty. In some Betty has to deal with behavior and how to act but it comes from a root meaning to sit down. And then from there, derivative means to sit down, to have a conversation, to do trade, to do business. But also because it has is is it's also associated with um, behavior or the way you behave. And it's and it's also a word for a home. I've combined the senses to mean home training. So our ethical system is called home training in Sumbedi because that's what we as African-American people, when we see something, you know, we see somebody acting all foolish in these streets. The first thing that we talk about is uh, who, who raised you or you don't have no home training or act like you got some home training because home training is the ethical system. It is the principles that you learn living in the home, the greeting everyone in the home and grandmothers, you know, uh, picking up after yourself, learning how to treat people, how to respect your elders, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, we continue. And so uh, I've also suggested that we create our own uh, signs and symbols in the same fashion that the Akan have done with the Adinkra, except we would call them Busongi. And Busongi comes from a root Songa. Uh, it's two different words, but we're combining and we're synthesizing them. So remember that part of African-American, uh, the reoccurring themes is synergy, a synergy. Uh, a synergistic culture. And so we're synthesizing this, we're doing paranomy here. So there's a root songa, meaning to excite and to stimulate and to provoke. And then songa, meaning to cut to a point, pruning, sharpening, sculpture, and busongi a sculpture. The, you know, all words for writing in every language comes from a word meaning to cut, to, to carve, right? And so these symbols are designed to excite, to stimulate, and to provoke thought and movement. So we call them busongi. So that's going to be the African-American label for our equivalent to Adinkra symbols, right? And so in our educational system, you know, we, we, we African-American, like we, we're having these cosmological wheels. And so in our educational system, in our rites of passage, everything is designed to answer these four questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What is my purpose? What must I do to fulfill that purpose? 
In other words, who I be, where have I been, who or what am I becoming, and what must be done. This is the framework for our African-American educational system. When you are discovering self, it, it, it needs to fit into this framework. And then understanding value, because those things are, are leaning towards our values. And we have African-Americans understand four fundamental sets of value that we become. We have intrinsic value. We have accumulated value. Accumulated value is your individual value based upon your abilities and skills. Then you have social communal values, the collective skill set and value set of the community. And then V4, your self-defined value. How do you see yourself? What do you see as, as your valuable, your value beyond your skills that you've accumulated in knowledge because of your education and training, right? These are the conversations that you have when you have a culture. And I argue that we need to rename some of these, these, some of these black cities. So I've renamed some of the cities. So of course, you know, Bukanda is Africa at large. I put in Banzi for Washington, DC, because it's the capital. This is the chief's residence, right? Bukongo for New Orleans. Bunanga for Philadelphia, because that word Nanga means love. And so, you know, Philadelphia is uh, the city of brotherly love. Kakanda, Atlanta, Little Africa. Chibakulu, Los Angeles, or Chi in Kwamba. You know, it's a city of angels, but we don't believe in angels. We believe in ancestors and Orishas. So Chibakulu, the ancestors, the place of the ancestors, right? Bukam, New York, because it is the hub and the center for all the groups coming together and, and living out their existence. Chiambabwe, New York, Newark, New Jersey, for example. They call it Brick City. We call it Brick City. But in Zimbabwe, like when you say Zimbabwe, it's a word for stone, right? And Bumoya, Bumoyo, Detroit. Moya, Moyo is a word for soul, spirit. And, you know, it's, it's the soul city, Detroit, which will be, uh, again, on April the 30th and Sunday, May the 1st for the One Africa Power and Unity Conference. Make sure you visit copyfilm.com to get your tickets. All right. Right. And I also suggest, and this can actually be kind of pan-African, that we, we, we liberate and we retake our sense of time. And so part of that is to rename each day of the week. And so we rename each day of the week after the seven principles of Kwanzaa. So what we call Sunday, we call Umoja. What we call Monday is Kuja Chakalia. On Tuesday, Ujima. Wednesday is Ujama. Thursday is Nia Purpose. Friday is Kuumba. And Saturday is Imani Faith. And what my suggestion is, is that, you know, we make it a, a thing to, to consciously and practice at minimum on each one of these days in the day a week we do something so right so for example on 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 ujima which would be equivalent to wednesday which is cooperative economics so we make it a, a point to buy something from a black owned business here in the united states or abroad so if we're going to if we're going to shop if we're going to spend money on ujima we make sure that one of our purchases at minimum is from a black owned business. This is culture. This is how you shape the behavior and attitudes and interests of the people. And so that ends my presentation. And so we've been rocking for a minute and I'm debating whether I should do and after show or just do a question and answer because we're already at two hours and 24 uh minutes and 
so you know and i know there was a lot of comments and i just won't be able to uh look at and answer uh, all the comments so that's something i'll just have to revisit after the show so what is um see he said after show let's do after show all right so let me uh See, I don't have a long enough. Uh, all righty. So what I'll do is I will play, even though it's it's kind of outdated now since the the thing. This is just going to be um, played so that I can um, set up the next show. So I'm going to set it up for like 4.45, uh, you know, give you a chance to go to the restroom or whatnot, and then I will share the link and you can join the panel and we can discuss uh, everything that was discussed here. And so let me, uh, let me, so, I'll just do this and say, let me just make sure. And so I'm, I'm gonna, while this is playing, I'll be setting up the next show and then I'm going to come back uh, once I finish setting it up. So I'll be right back. You see, I have a lot of things, a lot of things that's on my mind and I would like to let them out. I see reality breaking down all my fantasies It would be nice if I at least had one fantasy That neutrality about to take a terabyte From the American apple pie better get a slice It's kinda scary the way that this life is moving on Marvin's doing backflips inside this grave, what's going on? We have head-on collisions, not seeing another's vision Maybe that's the reason why some colors fit the description Lot of relationships need life rafts, sinking ships I guess you just can't have only one like potato the chips. I would love for you to listen with an open heart But would you really even hear me if it's torn apart? I don't do the things that I used to I'll be fine even if I lose you okay? Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Peace and blessings family, my name is Asar Motep And I am with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology As well as the popular YouTube channel Mbongi I'm an Africologist and computer scientist out of Houston, Texas and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I have spent the last 20 years researching the connections between ancient Kemet, that is modern Egypt, and modern Bantu speaking cultures of Central and Southern Africa. Throughout this 20 year journey, I've examined all the relevant literature in numerous languages, collected paleontological as well as archeological data from across millennia. I have presented hypotheses and abandoned hypotheses, come to conclusions and abandoned conclusions, reviewed arguments for and against known hypotheses, and analyzed frameworks that sought to define and characterize the vast array of African experiences. After over 20 years of asking critical questions of history, of philosophy, religion, and culture, I have finally gotten to the point where I have complete and total faith in the results of our research. I say our research because I am one of among a number of scholars who have either laid the foundations in classical Africology or are continuing to expand and develop more robust research on this connection between ancient Egyptian and Bantu civilizations. After spending so much time behind the computer and in the libraries and in the museums for over 20 years, I believe it is time to go out and to touch the living artifacts and engage with the people involved in the research whose stories we have been telling all this time, which brings us to why we are here today. Although I have written and will continue to write about the results of my research, my goal now is to summarize this data and present it in documentary film form. I have decided to put some of that computer science as well as new media experience together to creatively tell this important aspect of African history that many may not be aware of. The title of the film is Chinna Intu, Ancient Kemet, 
and the Into Universe. And we are currently raising funds for the first phase of our journey. In February of 2022, I will be joining the crew of the award-winning documentary film, Hoppy, the role of economics on the development of civilization for a very important returning to the source tour and conference in Egypt, which we know is in Northeast Africa. And while I am there, I will be shooting parts of our film, Chiena Into, and gathering footage for a proof of concept trailer, which will be used for greater fundraising efforts in the near future. And this is where you come in. I am currently trying to raise $5,000 to help with location expenses, equipment rentals, insurance, and the like, so that we can get some great shots for some primary as well as B-roll footage. When we return from Egypt, some of this footage will be combined with some preliminary interviews to compile a unique trailer to give the audience and potential investors a glimpse of the vision and potential of the film. Our ultimate goal is to travel to places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zimbabwe, Uganda, and South Africa for the first film. And did I forget to mention that we intend for this to be a series of documentary films. Therefore, subsequent films will require us to travel to places like Cameroon, Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal, as well as Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. We have big goals, and with your help, we can make this happen. And if you're interested in donating to this film project, please visit our website at www.shinnaintofilm.com where you can leave a donation. There are other ways you can donate as well, which includes joining our Patreon page, uh, donating through Cash App, or donating live when we're doing the live show on YouTube. And the YouTube channel has over 6,000 subscribers and Facebook has over 5,000 uh, subscribers as well. And with a minimum donation of like $5 each, we can uh, quickly reach our goal. You can spread the word of our efforts by sharing this video with friends and colleagues, as well as liking it. We appreciate your help and all donors will be given credit on the website as well as at the end of the film during the credits. We thank you from the bottom of our heart to those who have given generously already and we look forward to bringing this important film to the public. Hotel. So I have set up the show, uh, the after party or after conversation. And so it'll be on this channel. We will convene back here at uh, 4.45. So that's less than 15 minutes, probably about 11, 12 minutes uh, from now. I have put the link to the show in the, uh, the chat. And when you go to the, um, the new page, there is a link to the uh, the panel discussion uh, if you want to join the panel and continue this conversation. So I do appreciate each and every one of you for uh, for joining the conversation and um, actively engaging in the chat. Uh, thank you for your time, and we are about to move to the after party. So I will see you there. And y'all be easy. All right, peace.